Now joining me in the studio is the former Secretary of State from 1999 to 2006 and current chair of the State Government Finance Policy and Elections Committee, Senator Mary Kiffmeyer. Welcome. Glad to be here, Shannon. There are a couple of voting changes passed in the last legislative session that will take effect in 2018, including uniform election dates and polling places. So what do Minnesotans need to know about these changes? That they're very important to them. Matter of fact, the whole focus of this was about the voters because that's what elections are for. It's for the voters. It's for them to do the governing of the people, by the people. That's what happens on election day. So the most frequent complaint was the changing of polling places and the changing of voting dates. Very frustrating to people, and it results in decreased voter turnout. And so by having uniform election days and uniform polling places, it's a specific piece of legislation signed by the governor, now in law, takes effect December 31st of this year. And so the uniform dates are five dates a year, and the townships have their own special dates, so that is a sixth one. So the general election and the August uh, primary are two of them, mm -hmm. and the others uh, happen during the winter. And so we have May, we have April, and we have, I think it is February. Yeah, February. So they're mm -hmm. going to be the first Tuesday of those months. First Tuesdays of those months. And the polling places will be established by December 31st of the year before. Okay. And then those cannot be changed unless there is an emergency or if for some reason the polling place is not available. Uh, then they can change them, but otherwise they have to stay the same. And the school districts have to use those polling places. They cannot change them for a school election referendum, whatever that it may be. Uh, they have to choose out of that basket and also new in state laws. They have to consider geographical balance and also population. So those factors are new to school districts and um, are really a voter friendly and should result in some increased turnout. It will take a while for people to get used to the fact that that's really the case. And I would expect that there would be some information gotten out by each county election official, city or township that helps make sure that everybody knows that. But at least once you go to a polling place, that's it for the rest of the year. And so then people will know and there won't be any confusion and they can come out and vote. That's right. And my preference actually would have been even for the school districts to use all of the same precincts so that the one you're used to going to in August or November is the one that you get to go in any school district election. Mm -hmm. uh, but they disagreed with that the, through the school board association and so on, disagreed with that and they wanted to be able to combine some precincts uh, in those elections that they have that are separate from a regular election day, but then they have to use one of those five days and they have to use out of that basket of polling places that were established by December 31st, but they can do some combining mm -hmm. based upon geographical and population balance. Let's turn to the Presidential Advisory Commission started by President Trump, uh, led by Vice President Mike Pence to look into voter fraud. The current Secretary of State has denied the request for information, and I'm wondering where you, where you fall on that. I don't agree with the current Secretary of State in that regard. I don't think that as an administrator in the process of giving out election data routinely every single day, every single week, you can buy this data, public data, because who you vote for is a secret. That is the privacy issue. But who you are in regards to being listed on the voter registration list is not a secret. And so that is public data, and that is by statute and also by the court. So that is public data. And the motives are never been asked. I mean, when, when I was Secretary of State, the only question was you signed the form and said you're going to use this for political or for legal purposes. Sometimes law enforcement have a warrant, and then they have the right to access the data. But other than that, they do not. And so the um, selling of the data is there all the time being done every day. Now, the commission said, if it is legally available, uh, we would like the social security numbers and their actual birth date. Minnesota law does not allow social security numbers to be public data. That is private data in its entirety. And also their complete birth date is private data. But the year of their birth, 1980, 1990, or whatever it may be, that is included on the public information voter registration list. And so I believe the standing of the Secretary of State is that that which is public data, that which is regularly given out uh, as public data should be released to the 
to this commission. I believe that's the duty of an administrative officer. Questioning motives beyond that and saying, well, you might use it for this or you might use it for that, or I'm not confident in the person who's leading this and the predictable outcome and some of that. Do, does the Secretary of State quiz like that to the DFL party or the GOP party when they ask for the list and they buy those lists or any candidate? If you don't, then you shouldn't be doing it in regards to this either. It's an administrative function and that data which is public should be given to that commission. Let's turn to provisional ballots. Ballots, 46 states have them, um, which involves keeping challenged votes separate until they can be verified. Last session, you spearheaded an effort to start doing that in Minnesota. Will you continue that effort in the next legislative session? I would definitely continue the effort. I don't know if I'll do it in the next legislative session. It's more of a supplemental year, um, but I would consider that. However, the governor and the Democrats are adamantly, absolutely opposed to it. So I think the likelihood of that being able to go into law would be unlikely, and so that would make a difference. But I still believe, and when you have 46 states doing it, uh, and several of them are also same-day voter registration states, which do have an exemption in the federal Help America Vote Act law, but several other states have done it as well. It's just a plain, a really good practice to do to have provisional ballots. It's a fail safe, it's a backup, and uh, also the way I had written the um, provisional ballot law was unique in regards to um, the fact that those who are challenged due to felony status, guardianship status, residency status, um, citizenship status, any of those constitutional legal requirements that are there for voting, that's administratively challenged through the county auditor's office, the county election official. So that's placed on administratively. So we realized that we could administratively remove the challenge without the voter having to come in. So that was one of the concerns. Some, in some states, if it's challenged, then the voter has to come back. Mm -hmm. But you're saying that in, in the legislation you tried to push last session, that was not going to be a criteria. Is that correct? It wasn't because we did a very limited uh, set of voters, and that is those who are already challenged for some legal purpose, uh, information from the courts, which is accurate, information from the Department of Public Safety, which is accurate, information from the Department of Corrections, which is also accurate. Residency, they say they uh, send out a postal verification card when they voted same-day registration the last time, mm -hmm. and the card came back as no such address or no such person mm -hmm. living here. Then that challenge, if that can't be resolved by the county administration official, that challenge is placed on that voter's record. Okay. Well, to come in and just say, I swear it's right, and then the postal verification card comes out back again. You know, that is not right. I mean, you right. either live there or you don't live there. Right. And so it's, it's just a function. But so we, because we did administrative challenges only, uh, other voter registration um, issues are identity, who you are. Right. And that is more of a photo ID question. So other states who have a question of, are you who you say you are? And my question is, how do you know without right. a photo ID? To turn to a more philosophical question, if increasing percentages of the electorate no longer have faith in the security and sanctity of the voting process, where does that leave us as a state and even as a nation? I think absolutely crucial to the whole voting process is that confidence. We give confidence through the election process in recounts. If things are within that half percent, then we recount and we do it very well and we make corrections afterwards. What we don't have is in voter registration. In voter registration, we do not have that same level of integrity, and so people don't have that same confidence. That's why those questions keep coming up. So there has to be a balance of integrity and accuracy and privacy. Those are all things that are very, very important to election process. And when you increase that, and when you make that a focus, you do increase voter turnout. While I was Secretary of State for those eight years, Minnesota was number one in voter turnout for all eight years. And not only that, our young kids increased their voter turnout as well, higher than it had ever been in the past and has not really continued because that is absolutely crucial to turning out the vote and having good high voter turnout is confidence in the system. But it has to be the entire system, not only recounting the ballots that are in the ballot box, but who gets the ballot is also important to make sure those who should have them get them. Those who should not, do not. Very simple. Easy to vote, hard to cheat.
One last question. Although a constitutional amendment in 2012 was defeated that would have required a valid photo ID be um, shown when voting, you've said that you're still in favor of this um, common sense policy, is what you've called it. As some of these laws have been struck down in other states by the courts, most recently Texas, have your views on this issue evolved at all? I would say not the concept of the fact that saying you are who you are, but then having your ID with you to also prove it. The version of the ID, uh, what kind of IDs, I think the courts have said they need to be multiple, they need to be many, so that whatever qualifies as proving your identity has many tools to do so. And I think that's a very important consideration. It's interesting that the U.S. Supreme Court upheld photo ID in the state of Indiana. I think they're the model to use. I think the broadness of their IDs that you can use, the timing and the other issues involved with that are valid. And by the way, recently a poll was done in Minnesota and the support for photo ID is still very high and very strong. But it needs to be written in a way that complies with court challenges. And court challenges will still come. But I think we can learn from all those other states and I'm carefully keeping an eye on all of those other states for what are those conditions that do pass muster in regard to supporting a photo ID, because the citizens certainly do support it. Senator Kefmeyer, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me.